Let's turn your hymnals to number 646. Number 646. Redeemed. Oh, he loves to proclaim it. 646. We're going to sing the first and the last. 646. Dear, dear friend, Lynn Weston, glad he's in glory, but still it's tough. Take your Bibles, please. We're turning to Genesis chapter 20. We're going to be reading one more time the first 13 verses, Genesis chapter 20, verses 1 through 13. It's in the first book of the Bible. And as you find that, I'll invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's holy and precious word. And Abraham sojourned from and journeyed from there toward the Negev and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said unto him, Behold, thou art a, but a dead man, for... The woman whom thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister. And she, even she herself said, he is my brother, in the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me, therefore I allowed uh, thee not to touch her. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live, and if thou restore not, know that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are in thine house. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their ears, and the men were very much afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us, and what have I offended thee that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to have been done. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What didst thou have in view that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet indeed she is my sister, she is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. And it came to pass, when God caused me to wander from my father's house, that I said unto her, This is thy kindness which thou shalt show unto me. At every place to which we shall come, say of me, He is my brother. Thank you. you may be seated for a time of prayer. O oh God, once again we've entered into these gates with thanksgiving in our hearts. Where would we be without our great God? Where would we be without your promises? Where would we be without your truth? Where would we be without the precious words of the precious word of God? Lord, thank you for the privilege of worshiping you today. I pray that you would help us and our hearts desires that every aspect of this service, including our giving, would bring honor and glory to you, exalt you and you alone. 
Thank you for the privilege of serving you. Thank you for the privilege of walking alongside of others who know you and love you and obey you. Thank you that you continue to increase our great cloud of witnesses, those who have gone on before us but are leaving us with a life that's been lived for Jesus. Thank you for your love and grace and mercy to us today. And thank you that that's extended to all those who very much need it. And we know you'd be the God of all comfort. And uh, we testify of that very personally. And then it's with confidence that we pray for comfort from you, for those who are hurting, especially uh, Brother Lynn Weston's extended family. Would you continue to minister to them in a very special way and minister to our own people, God, as we uh, certainly over many years have had the privilege and opportunity of coming to know and love him. Lord, I pray that you would be honored and glorified as we proceed and may this day, this hour, uh, resound to the glory of God. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Let's turn our hymnals to number 466. Number 466, what a friend we have in Jesus. We're going to sing the first and the last, and when we start the last verse, Junior Church will be dismissed. So let's stand together as so we sing 466.
In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And, and the, the dead, dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not fade. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Thank you, Janice. We appreciate that. He really is everything to us. He's the seeking and saving God, and we have been reminded of that at every turn in our study of Genesis. He's the God of all comfort. He's the God of hope. Uh, he's the God of promises. He's the God of grace. He's the God of mercy. Uh, he's the great God. Let's pray together. Lord, we are careful to acknowledge such things of you. We stand in awe of you again today, this hour, this moment. You are the great God and the one and only Savior. You are living and you are seeking and saving and many other things. And we praise you for that. 
And then to think that we have the word of this great God. How amazing is that? That you actually wrote it down for us. And God, and with a view to your greatness and with a view to the greatness of your word, there's really nothing else for us to pray than that you would write every one of your words on the fleshly tablets of our hearts. Again, that we would be a changed people. I'm thinking again this morning of how important our minds are. And oh God, we pray for a transformed mind again by the word of God, aided by the spirit of God. Oh, that you would change our thinking when it needs to be changed. Oh, that our perspectives would be proper and biblical and spiritual. God, simply put, I pray that you would help us to think like you. And of course, that's inseparably linked to our study of the word of God. And so help us as we continue to do that together, we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Our study in Genesis has brought us face to face with the grave sin of lying. Abraham and Sarah in chapter 20 lie to Abimelech, king of Gerar. Before we re-engage that, I have to confess something to you. I sometimes weary in talking about sin. And all the temptation to skip it. And all the pressure, both from society and even from the church, to hop, skip, and jump, and pick and choose your way through the inscripturated word of God. Think about what it's like to teach or preach faithfully and frequently about sin, knowing that your church would be much, much bigger and much more popular if you didn't. Someone might rightfully say, Pastor Tom, it seems that we are speaking, it seems like you are speaking about sin an awful lot to which I would respond, yes, but only when God speaks of it. Would you hear that again? Pastor Tom, it seems like you're speaking an awful lot about sin. Yes. But only when God does. It's not like we come here and we start um, strolling through a beautiful garden full of beautiful flowers and the arrangements just thrill our soul and we are um, we, we feel like skipping and Mr. Bluebird is on our shoulder and then all of a sudden Pastor Tom from the outside in just throws a big damp blanket over it all. I remind you that we are systematically exegetically and expositionally working our way through the Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and word by word. I cannot overemphasize the import and significance of what I just said to you that we are studying our way through the Bible book by book chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and even word by word, that bespeaks our talking about sin each and every time that we come to it. I have a sidebar. I'm inserting it very quickly before I re-engage that particular thing with you. 
I am thankful. And by the way, I must tell you, even though I'm going to talk a little bit about myself, this is not about me. I am thankful, I'm speaking from a pastoral standpoint, I'm thankful that I don't always hear the critiques on my ministry. But I do hear some. And God, uh, you know, certainly graces me through that. Again, I, th there's no reason for you to even begin to feel sorry for me. But by the way, wow, I was rehearsing with God again this morning that your and my lives are a breeze. And I don't care what you're going through. You and your and my life are, lives are a breeze compared to the lives of God's people down through the ages. Think about being an Old Testament prophet where God says, this is what you need to say to the people, but you might want to know that they're going to kill you for it. So we got it good. One of the critiques, and I have no names associated to any, all this, uh, to any of this, and that's good too, but one of the critiques on um, the pulpit ministry here at Calvary is that we go so very slow. But I'm wondering if you've ever thought about this before, and forgive me for, uh, you know, uh, potentially being a little bit emotional because this is hard stuff for me. We're in the process of studying our way through the Bible. We're studying our way through Genesis. No more strategic book in the whole of the word of God. Foundational to virtually everything else that God says. And I wonder if you've ever noted this. You and I, there's joy in this too, but sadness. You, you and I will never pass this way again. You and I, I'm telling you, we will never, you and I, will never corporately study our way through Genesis again. Never again in this earthly sojourn. I want you to know that. We will rehearse and we will revisit and we will concord and we will compare and we will compile we have one opportunity, seriously, to exegetically and expositionally study our way through the book of the beginnings. We're probably going too fast. But I want to re-engage this idea again. I'm emphasizing the fact that we are systematically, exegetically, and expositionally working our way through the Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And I've often in the past given you biblical warrant for that. By the way, it's not, and I have a number of by the ways, and this is a very interesting morning I I can sense this is a very interesting morning. It's not that we don't employ other approaches. We do from, for instance, topical studies. I think you'd be surprised. I'm going to list some of them for you. I think you'd be surprised at all the topical studies that you and I have undertaken over the years. Remember, we, we have been together for two decades. We've studied our way through the parables, prophecy, angels, Christ in the Old Testament scriptures, Christ in the tabernacle, the Old Testament gates of Jerusalem. We have studied Christ's Sermon on the Mount. We have studied heaven, hell, the spiritual gifts, tithing. I can't believe I'm still alive and here. <laughs> the armor of God, just to name, well, that's more than a few. And perhaps my favorite of all times, the names and titles of God. But the warp and woof 
of our approach to the study of the scriptures with biblical warrant is our taking an expository approach. Again, the exegetical and expositional study, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and sometimes even word by word. Why don't you do something with me with a view to our study of Genesis? This is going to be a very interesting activity for you. I want you to do some thumbing. Like, you know, like legitimate thumbing. Like not putting it to your nose <laughs> and not getting your thumb machine out. But thumbing through the pages of Scripture. Now, we're, we're going to have to be somewhat efficient with this because of the volume of the thing. It's, it's in relationship to what we've already seen in our study of Genesis. So I, we'll kind of do it like a Bible drill. And, and again, you guys are even better than I in regard to that, and so you'll probably have to, you, you'll probably, um, have to wait for me at different junctures. But we're going to begin at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. A little bit of a Bible drill. We're going to scoot our way. We're going to thumb our way through the study of Genesis that we've already undertaken. And this with a view to the fact that we're doing something that's very unpopular, and that is we are often and frequently speaking about sin. And by the way, in case I forget to do that, and I know I've identified it with you before, and it's back to the idea of, of seeking popularity. Boy, I, you know, I look out at our church and there, there could be uh, a dozen different reasons why there's holes in our church again this morning. And some of them could legitimately be directed against me. But don't prostitute God's truth And don't take the word of God for anything other than what it claims to be. And don't buck against what God does in his word. Because he loves us. And then in the end, it's all for our good. We could very easily join the contemporary church arriving at the place where we no longer even use the word sin. And we would very quickly fill in the holes. We're starting with Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. I have something written in my Bible. You can look at this later in case you're questioning the reality of it. But above chapter 3 and verse 1, I have nothing but good stuff, yea, very good stuff, in chapters 1 and 2, this is what I have written at the top of my Bible. Very interesting, this forthcoming from our study. It's been so helpful to me. Nothing but good stuff, yea, very good stuff. Remember, God, back in chapter 1 and verse 31, said, everything's very good. Nothing but good stuff, yea, very good stuff in chapters 1 and 2. But in chapter 3, the sin train starts to roll. Chapter 3 and verse 1, now the serpent was more subtle than any, be than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, has God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. This is the fall, this is the prelude to the fall of man, Adam and Eve's first sin. And the accompanying curse, by the way, that God has the audacity of talking to us about in great length. Take a look at chapter 4 and verse 8. We've got to do this quick now for you to appreciate the effect. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. It's the first murder. Verse uh, 19 of chapter 4. And Lamech took unto him two wives. It's the first mention of what will become a very difficult and complicated sin, the sin of polygamy. 
Chapter 5 is entitled, and you may have this title there if you are using any kind of study Bible, Chapter 5 is entitled, The Reign of Death. And I'm asking you a question, why do people die? I'm asking you, class, the question, why do people die? Chapter 6 through 9 cover the universal, worldwide, catastrophic, cataclysmic flood of Noah's day. And why did the flood came? Take a look at verse 5 of chapter 6. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In Genesis chapter 9 and verse 21, Noah is, as my dad would say, drunker than a skunk. And in the very next verse, we have perhaps the first overture of the grave and encompassing sin of homosexuality. In chapter 11, we have prideful pagans building a temple at Babel, not in worship of the creator, but in worship of the creature. At the end of, verse, uh, at the end of chapter 11, God is trying to tear Abraham away from his family because Abraham's father, Tira, was an idol worshiper. In chapter 12, Abraham lies for the first time. In chapter 13, carnal Lot sinfully pitches his tent towards Sodom. In chapter 14, Abraham rescues Lot and the cities of the plain who have been taken captive because of their sin. In chapter 15, Israel's future captivity is predicted. I'm wondering why they're going to go into captivity. In chapter 16, Sarah pridefully and rebelliously tries to help God fulfill his promise to Abram by giving to Abram her Egyptian handmaid, Hagar. Good idea. In chapter 17, Abraham doubts God and argues with him regarding Ishmael. In chapter 18, Sarah doubts God. And later, Abraham has to intercede on behalf of carnal Lot and the wicked cities of the plain who have absolutely been overtaken by the grave sin of homosexuality. In chapter 19, the avenging angels have to literally drag Lot and his family out of Sodom and Gomorrah before they destroy these wicked cities. And the chapter ends with Lot's daughters having sex with their stupid dad. And that brings us to Genesis chapter 20, where Abraham and Sarah lie a second time. Do we talk about sin a lot? Yes, we do. But only because God does. But here's the thing, and really the heart, I believe, of God's message to us. I think this is a prelude to our continuing to engage the text. And for all of us, including your pastor, to feel free. <laughs> what do we do with this reality? What do we do with this harsh and unpleasant reality that in our systematic study of the word of God, at every turn we are confronted with sin? What do we do about that? Do we stop studying the Bible? Do we join the popular trend that we would pick and choose our way and we sing as we do, accenting the positive? What then? Simply this. Thank God for a simple mind. Thank God for a simple mind. First C. This is what we must do. I guess this is a charting our course message. First C. And then embrace the good news that is inherent in every single time that God takes his anthropomorphic finger and places it on our sin. So you can't talk, and this is something to rejoice about. I'm going to try it. I'm going to encourage you to stay in your pew. Don't be getting too excited. We don't want anybody rolling around, but the reality is you can't talk about sin without also talking about the Savior. You can't get to the Savior without wading through your sin. And I would say this to God's people, listen, you can't get to Christ-likeness 
apart from wading through your sin. But it's good news, good news, good news that God cares enough about us, loves us enough, Oh, that I would love God enough so that I would have the heartbeat that, God, I want you to put your finger on anything in my life that's displeasing to you. God, I love you enough, and I love the process that has begun to unfold in my life, a process that not only takes me to glory, but even now is conforming me to the image of Christ. That's why we're here. And as you and I are walking around in this earthly sojourn of ours and showing forth Christ and telling forth Christ and the way that he's transformed our lives, then the entire world is impacted by us. Glory. Hallelujah. Can't talk about sin without talking about the Savior. By the way, boy, this, I should have told Mrs. Ann, I was going to say this. Should I say this, Lord? I should have talked to you about this ahead of time. I have never preached or taught never preached to you, not a single time, in talking about sin, that I didn't proffer to you the Savior. You can't get to the Savior apart from wading through your sin. And I'll tell you something, this is really neat, because a lot of you guys are Boy, you're embracing the high calling of God on your lives. And the fact of the matter is you're living, uh, you're living not perfectly, but, but faithfully. You are, you are living the life that God has called you to live. It isn't like we come into these gates and we're systematically studying our way through the scripture. And each and every time that we do, God's putting his finger on a particular sin in my life, there are some times when we come into these gates and God talks to us by, uh, about a particular sin and we have, the, we, we have the great joy of humbly acknowledging before God that that given sin is not present in our lives. But our response to that is, God, thank you for reminding me that it could be. And thank you for repositioning me on my spiritual toes so that I continue to live my life in prevention of that sin. Man, when you really see it, and I know I continue to fail you in all of these realms, but when you really see it, you say, God, bring it on. It's not fun wading through the sin, but oh, is it worth it? We stop talking about sin, refuse to even use the word. We proffer the Savior. And then we wonder how the church in the last days ends up being consisting, consisting of mostly the unsaved. Because we made Christ into a candy bar. Try him. And you'll like him. I'm telling you that we should love God enough to be constantly and consistently saying to him, I want you to talk to me about anything. I want you to talk to me about all things, including my sin. Because no matter what he talks to us about, it invariably leads to the Savior. My knowing him, that's salvation. And my being like him, that's the great doctrine of sanctification. In the end, 
It all leads, some would say, an inseparable link. The only place it breaks down is in regard to our very own hearts. In the end, it all leads to good news. Salvation for the sinner, sanctification for the saint. Is this what you want to continue to do? Is this the church that you want to be in the last days? And are we willing to not compromise even as we are now incurring the cost? Good news, God cares enough about us to confront us with our sin. And good news, God is merciful and gracious enough to offer forgiveness. How could that ever be bad? How could we ever tire of that? If talking to us about our sin, both actual and potential, and I love this, and I'm encouraging you, for those of you that are mature in the faith, and that, again, you're in the process day by day and even moment by moment, embracing the high calling of, your, uh, of God on your life to live a holy life. Embrace the challenge of potential sin. Love God enough to say, God, I don't want you to only have to put your finger on sin that's present in my life. I want you to continue to talk to me about sin that may be there, that has the potential to be there. If it all leads to the Savior, knowing him and being like him, then we can rejoice over each and every time that God talks to us about sin. I have, I'm leaving you with a, a completely different angle and it'll probably get you reeling a little bit. Question. How often do you sin? Let's see, if we sin just once a year, then I suppose that we can anticipate God talking to us just once a year about sin. If we sin just once a month, then I, again, with a sense of logic and reasonableness, I can envision God talking to us then once a month about sin. If we sin once a week, if we sin once a day or perhaps many sins in a single day and perhaps even now our hearts gripped with harbor sin. You and I look at God talking to us about and we say that's bad news. The truth is, it's good through and through. And God's goal in your and my life is to first save us, make sure you're saved. There's only one Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and then beyond salvation to conform us to his image. So I'm wondering if you will continue study the word of God with me systematically exegetically and expositionally let's pray God thank you Lord, thank you for the reality of these things. And although I 
I know that we have a lot of things to consider and contemplate it. It's going to keep coming back to this amazing reality. And that is that each and every time that you talk to us about our sin, it's, a, and it's an expression of your deep and abiding love for us. Every time you talk to us about sin, it is so that you can lead us to the Savior. Every time you talk to us about sin, it is so that you can bring us more into the conformity of the image of your Son. And when we see it, we actually say, God, bring it on. First of all, help me to live a life that is free from sin. But then, God, help me not to buck against you putting your finger on sin in my life. I love you. And I want to be like your Son and my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for those who may be here today, apart from the Savior, that even through this humble offering, they would see their need and embrace him. And again, we'd be thrilled to help with that. But God, this really relates an awful lot to what kind of course we're going to chart in these last days in which we live. So help us in regard to that, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's turn to number 223. Number 223, I stand amazed. When you find it, let's stand together. Sing closing 223. Bob, would you close us a word of prayer? Please. Our loving Father, you've given us a full course meal this morning, and now it's up to us to digest it, to take it into our lives that we might be able to leave this place, go into your mission field, and not feel ashamed to rightly divide the word of truth. Bless and dismiss us now with your blessings. Thank you again, Jesus, for a wonderful pastor. We pray in Christ's name, amen.